Welcome everyone. Today in part three of the big five natural causes of climate change, I want to demonstrate how more frequent La Ninas have warmed the world. La Ninas promote clear skies over the Eastern Pacific, increasing solar heating. As a result, the Eastern Pacific absorbs over 100 watts per meter squared more solar energy than it releases back to space. A similar but smaller energy imbalance occurs in the eastern Atlantic during Atlantic Ninias. The blue regions release more energy back to space than their surfaces absorb, and that excess energy was initially absorbed and transported from the tropics. Climate scientists agree any imbalance between the Earth's absorption and release of energy can cause climate change. However, the question remains, how much of that imbalance is caused by ocean dynamics versus increasing CO2 concentration? In all peer-reviewed research, the world's energy budget is measured in terms of watts, the flow of energy per second. For example, a burning candle emits 80 watts, but step just one meter away from that candle and you will not feel its heat. So to express the effects of heat energy, Heat is measured in the amount of watts reaching a square meter of surface area, or watts per meter squared. On average, the Earth's atmosphere and surfaces absorb 240 watts per meter squared of solar energy. Claims of a climate crisis are based on the belief that CO2 is causing the Earth to retain just one more watt of solar energy than it releases back to space. But natural ocean dynamics also cause the Earth to retain more absorbed solar energy than it releases back to space. The greatest amount of heat absorption happens when the Pacific is in its neutral condition, or a La Nina-like state, which is simply a more extreme neutral state. The trade winds blow warm waters across the Pacific and concentrate them in the Western Pacific, in the Indian Ocean creating the warmest body of water on Earth, the Indo-Pacific Warm Pool. The removal of water from the Eastern Pacific allows cool subsurface waters to upwell. There, the cooler temperatures generate fewer clouds, which increases the absorption of solar energy by at least 15 watts per meter squared. Furthermore, the resulting east to west temperature difference amplifies the trade winds causing a positive feedback that favors maintaining La Nina-like conditions. Strong trade winds cause more heated water to be stored deeper in the western Pacific where the heat is inhibited, inhibited from ever ventilating back to space. Now climate scientists are really aware of this dynamic that increases ocean warming, but they only bring it to the public's attention when they blame the ocean for creating a hiatus in the rise of global average temperatures that contradicts the simplistically based predictions of warming driven by rising CO2. Now, James Hansen is considered the godfather of the climate crisis. Initially, he studied the climate on Venus, which is lifeless and totally devoid of water. So naturally, his analyses and models of climate change are typically focused on the greenhouse gases that affected Venus. To his credit, Hansen admits this bias in his 2005 paper stating, our climate model is driven mainly by increasing human-made greenhouse gases and aerosols. But Hansen also realized that regards the Earth's climate, one may find other combinations that yield warming comparable to that of the past century. An increased understanding of the effects of El Ninos and La Ninas is providing such an alternative combination of effects and a comparable alternative explanation for the warming that Hansen and his acolytes blame on CO2. Now, Hansen didn't carefully examine those El Nino effects because, as he stated, his coarse resolution ocean models had been unable to simulate climate variations associated with El Nino Southern Oscillation processes. Now, the improving understanding of El Nino and La Nina effects will likely cause the CO2-driven climate crisis claims to fall like a house of cards. 
climate scientists have calculated the Earth's energy budget, but it is plagued with large uncertainties. However, when trying to convince the public that their science is settled, illustrations such as this one posted by NASA hide all those uncertainties. Fortunately, the budget calculations by Stevens' 2012 published paper exhibited more integrity and highlighted those uncertainties. NASA's yellow arrows show incoming absorbed and outgoing reflected solar radiation. NASA's red arrows show the outgoing infrared radiation and the back radiation from greenhouse gases that recycle the infrared and delay the rate of the Earth's cooling. Nonetheless, eventually nearly all the infrared energy escapes back to space, except in mere 0.6 watts per meter squared with an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.4 watts per meter squared. Regards how much energy that the ocean stores and releases, the uncertainty is huge. The uncertainty of the cooling effects by evaporation alone or latent heat is plus or minus 10 watts, overwhelming the estimate of a CO2 driven energy imbalance. Now, during the Little Ice Age, the oceans cooled for about 400 years. The Pacific was mostly in a persistent El Nino-like state, a condition that reduces how much heat is stored at depth relative to a La Nina-like state. Solar minimums reduce the trade winds, which the El Nino-like state further weaken. One result of an El Nino-like ocean is the reduction of upwelling that brings nutrients to the sunlit layers. Thus, during the Little Ice Age, the Pacific exhibited low biological productivity. Then, in the early 1800s, as solar irradiance rose, the ocean entered a more La Nina-like state, increasing upwelling in ocean productivity. A switch to a more persistent La Nina-like state amplifies the trade winds and raises sea levels in the western Pacific. Accordingly, between 1993 and 2010, satellites observed western Pacific sea levels rising many times higher than the global average. The stronger winds of a La Nina-like state drive more warm water into the western Pacific, increasing the size and the depth of the Indo-Pacific warm pool. The warm pool's growing heat is then transported around the world. Now, oceans can warm just by reducing the overall cooling rate, even if there's no increase in absorbed heat. During La Nina's, more heat is stored at depths, typically up to 200 meters, and those depths inhibit ventilation of that heat. The estimated 3 watts per meter squared of infrared heat from the back radiation of greenhouse gases never penetrates more than a couple of microns below the surface. For reference, a human hair is about 70 microns thick, and a thousand microns equal just one millimeter. In contrast, hundreds of watts of sunlight energy can penetrate 10 million times deeper depending on how clear the water is. The shorter wavelengths of sunlight can penetrate up to 100 meters depth. In general, there's a steady cooling of the ocean that is controlled by just a one millimeter thick layer at the surface. In addition, storms like hurricanes will episodically pull heat from the deeper layers. Depending on the depth of sunlight penetration, a layer of up to 100 meters thick warms the ocean each day. The diurnal warm layer. But the absorbed heat can only radiate away via the surface gateway that is less than 100 microns thick, termed the electromagnetic skin layer. In addition, heat can leave the ocean via contact with the air or via evaporation, which only happens from the 100 micron thick layer, termed the thermal skin layer. Because this layer is always losing heat, it is cooler than the diurnal warm layer below and is sometimes called the, school, the cool skin layer. This cooler skin surface ensures that the flow of heat 
is almost always from the warmer ocean layers below back into the atmosphere. As a result, the micron thick layer that absorbed the greenhouse infrared radiation is always ventilating any absorbed heat back into the atmosphere. And that's in contrast to the deeper and warmer solar heated layers. So it seems virtually certain that any change in ocean warming must be driven by solar changes and not from any changing concentration of greenhouse gases. During an El Nino event, hot water in the western warm pool sloshes eastward across the Pacific. Heated waters that had been stored at depths in the west are brought closer to the surface in the east, where strong evaporation ventilates a great portion of that heat and cools the ocean. As that warm pool heat then warms the eastern Pacific, it also reduces the trade winds and sometimes even reverses the trade winds direction, creating a feedback that prolongs an El Nino-like state. Largely governed by the winds, the amount of transported hot water varies from year to year. In the 1600s, Peruvian fishermen named that warm water arrival El Nino, referring to baby Jesus, because the flow of warm water arrived each year around Christmas time. Because El Ninos and La Ninas affect the winds and the jet streams, and thus extreme weather patterns as detailed in part two of this series, to improve weather forecasting, scientists measure changes in temperatures within the Nino 3.4 area for statistical purposes. When temperatures rise 0.5 degrees Celsius above average for about five months, an El Nino is declared. When temperatures drop 0.5 degrees Celsius below average, a La Nina event is declared. The greater the departure from average, the stronger the event's effects. Scientists also classify El Ninos according to the varying distance across the Pacific that the heated water travels. Graphs of globally average air temperatures are very sensitive to heat release by El Ninos. El Ninos are clearly seen as temperature spikes. To naive journalists and the general public, such warm spikes appear to confirm the coming global warming crisis, but such graphs only obscure real climate dynamics. As Kevin Trenberth, a chief architect of global warming theory admits, El Ninos are not just temporarily ventilating ocean heat, but cooling the Earth's entire climate. On the other hand, the cooler temperatures in the graph are associated with neutral conditions in La Ninas due to the upwelling of cold subsurface waters. And paradoxically, that's when the ocean is warming most. Clearly, because natural El Ninos and La Ninas have such critical effects on climate change, we would expect much more of the Earth's warming to be uh, attributed to El Nino dynamics. But the reason CO2 gets the blame instead is quite clear. After more than a decade since James Hansen admitted the inability of climate models to reproduce El Nino La Nino ocean dynamics, climate models still do not accurately simulate them. As published by climate scientists Michael Mayer and Trenberth and others in 2016, all climate models greatly underestimated changes in Pacific Ocean heat content. And climate models underestimate the redistribution of heated waters between varying depths and between the eastern and western ocean. So it is highly likely that climate models also underestimate La Nina's contributions to the steady increase of heat in the Indo-Pacific warm pool as well as underestimating the century rise in the average global temperature since the Little Ice Age termination when the Pacific entered a more La Nina-like state. Although El Nino events last for just about a year, its redistribution of heated water has much longer lasting effects associated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. The heated water that sloshed to the Eastern Pacific doesn't completely cool causing the eastern tropical Pacific to remain abnormally warm for 20 to 30 years. 
the reduced trade winds and other circulation changes reduced transport of warm waters to the northern Pacific, making it abnormally cool. This pattern of ocean surface temperatures is labeled the positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and strongly alters weather patterns, especially for the western North America. As in El Nino's residual warm waters continue to cool or get transported back to the western Pacific, the trade winds gradually increase and the resulting upwelling cools the eastern Pacific further. Circulation changes now pump more warm water into the northern Pacific and the resulting reverse temperature pattern is called the negative phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and it amplifies the wavy jet stream over western North America, increasing the probability of drought and heat waves. The net increase in warm pool and global temperatures can be explained by an El Nino-La Nina amplification effect. During an El Nino, heated warm pool water moves eastward primarily along the north equatorial countercurrent. And El Nino gives way to more neutral and La Nina conditions, much of El Nino's residual warm water then recirculates back to the warm pool via the north equatorial current and is reheated along the way. This reheated water is slightly warmer than the heated cold upwell waters that largely fill the warm pool. Some of that reheated water also circulates northward to warm the northern Pacific. An independent climate researcher and author, Bob Tisdale, was the first to recognize the higher temperature effects resulting from a La Nina-like state reheating residual warm waters from an El Nino event. The recirculation and reheating of residual warm El Nino waters results in a gradual stepwise warming of ocean temperatures after each El Nino event. The accumulating heat in the warm pool then feeds the ocean conveyor belt that transports that heat into the Indian Ocean, then the Atlantic, and up into the Arctic is illustrated by the Red Loop. Higher sea levels in the Western Pacific during La Nina's help push warm pool waters into the Indian Ocean. A portion of those waters are further heated in the Indian Ocean, which then get transported around the su southern Africa into the Atlantic, a dynamic referred to as the Agulhas leakage. Recent studies have detailed the pathway of the Algulhas leakage water into the Arctic. First, across the Atlantic, then across northern Brazil's coast and into the Caribbean, then up the east coast of North America and into the Arctic, thus linking La Nina warming to Arctic sea ice fluctuations. The oscillations in the Algulhas leakage correlate with the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. And that correlates with lost Arctic sea ice is detailed in part one of this series. That lost ice allowed more stored Arctic heat to ventilate and increase the global temperature, much like ventilation of deep warm pool waters also raises global temperatures. As Hansen unintentionally predicted in 2006, other combinations, such as discussed here, the transport of solar heated waters heated by more frequent La Ninas can yield alternative causes to explain a comparable warming. So up next, part four of the big five natural causes of climate change, landscape changes. And until then, embrace renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is the highest of duties and blind faith the one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science rarely presented in mainstream media, then please give it a like, give it a share, or copy the video's URL and email it to as many friends as possible. Subscribe to my channel to easily see all my videos or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, An Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.